I'm Frank Epstein, founder and president of Collage New Music. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our latest online presentation entitled The Composer Speaks. The Composer Speaks is an opportunity to introduce composers directly to you. Our guest today is composer, conductor, and pianist Lior Navok, who was born in Tel Aviv, Israel, in 1971. He studied composition and conducting at the Rubin Academy in Jerusalem, and he received a master's degree in Boston at the New England Conservatory, where he also completed his DMA. After graduating, he moved back to Israel, then to Paris for a year, and then to Germany, where he was based for several years before returning back to Israel, where he lives today. His music is performed around the world by major symphony orchestras and opera companies, including the Berlin Philharmonic, the Sydney Opera House, the Frankfurt Opera, and the Nuremberg Opera. His passion for the stage has led him to compose two operas, the Bet, based on its story by Anton Chekhov, and An Uneven Fluss, translated by Our River. These works have been performed in many languages, including German, French, Hebrew, Spanish, and Korean. His other passion is music for children, including works entitled The Little Mermaid, the Adventures of Pinocchio, Brave Little Tommy, and Beauty and the Beast. He has received numerous awards and has released highly acclaimed CDs. One of them was described by the American Record Guide as dreamy and utterly gorgeous. It is my pleasure now to introduce Collage Music Director David Hoos who will in turn introduce composer Lior Navok. We thank you all for joining us, and we hope this experience will bring you closer to new music and the composers that write it. Lior Navok, it is, a, it is an immense pleasure to see you, even if it's over an ocean and many time zones. Um, it, particularly great to see you because it really has been, I, I don't even know, over 10 years since I've actually laid eyes on you. I've known you for many years um, and have had the enormous pleasure of studying and conducting, th I think, at least three works of yours, a couple of with collage new music. And uh, I've had really exciting and enlivening conversations with you in the back of cars and at restaurants and things like that. But the, but the funny thing is that I actually don't know very much of your background at all. Your upbringing, your years in the Boston area, your life in Berlin, your life in Tel Aviv, where you are now. And I'm just, just to get us started, I'm wondering if you might share a little bit about that. Where were you born and, and what was your er, early education, particularly musical education? Um, what are its roots? Wow. So, yeah, first to say that, yes, it has been 10 years and I miss our conversations very much too. Uh, always very kind of a lot of subjects running on the table from side to side, and it's very exciting. Um, I was born in, in, in Tel Aviv, uh, 1971. And- um, Does that mean you're coming up to a big birthday? Coming up to a big birthday, yeah, next year. Um, okay. And- um, <laughs> Actually, it's this year, end of this year, time is passing. Um, but yes, I was born in, uh, in, uh, in Tel Aviv, um, not a musical family. 
appreciated a lot of music, but I never had classical music in the house. We were listening to yeah, Israeli music, uh, some, some jazz music my father used to listen, um, but mainly what was going on on the radio. And um, I enjoyed listening to stuff all the time and it thrilled me very much. I remember as a kid listening to uh, the main theme of the Good, Bad and Ugly. I was probably five or six uh, on the radio and I was like saying to myself, wow, this is like that. Took a long time, many years after I realized what it was and so, but it, things registered very deeply. Um, nothing in particular with education, uh, normal elementary school, normal high school, no music school, um, studied, actually started with electric keyboards, then moved to accordion, uh, then moved to piano. Uh -huh. Pop music, jazz music, and until I was probably, yeah, 20, 21, no classical music whatsoever. Um, it was simply not, not, not my- You had never heard any classical music? I heard here and there, uh, but when people told me come to a concert, uh, I would say, no, it's quite boring. I'm not interested. Um, <laughs> yes, so it was because, because back then when I was 16, 17, I was very much deep into the jazz um, and the harmonies and the sound and the possibilities and the rhythm and all this thing. When I had to put one of a jazz piece here next to a Beethoven sonata or, or a Mozart sonata, back then I was like, wow. I mean, the rhythm is extremely simpler with Mozart compares to Dave Gruber uh, and, uh, and so with the harmony. Uh, so it, it took me quite a long of time before I started kind of getting used to classical music, though I was playing it already in my lesson. So I was playing Bartok, Bach, and so, but as a habit, never listened. Where came the change? Uh, the change came um, when, actually it came in a very strange place. It came in a little military bus uh, in the middle of nowhere, to the middle of nowhere, um, when I actually had to prepare for an um, uh, entry exam uh, for the music academy here. And uh, they had a listening uh, uh, piece requirement, maybe 50, 60 pieces you have to identify before they accept you. And uh, as a jazz pianist, I knew nothing. So I had to go to, to a music store, get the CDs. And, and then on the way from performance to performance <clears throat> uh, on a bus as a soldier, I would listen and uh, discover Brahms symphonies and Mozart sonatas and all these things. Suddenly my eyes open. But nevertheless, when there was a Chicoria or a Bilevans or a, some nice big band sound, of course I would go that direction rather than drums being played or something. So that was that time. So what do you think happened that allowed you to begin to appreciate the uh, appreciate Beethoven, Brahms, uh, whatever classical music you were listening to, what what happened in your life? Because only a short time before you said it seemed so simple and kind of boring. Well, 
in a way, the, the process was actually going backwards. Uh, so it took, me, it took me quite a lot of time to get to Beethoven. It took me longer to get to Mozart. And the connection between the two was actually the BC Ravel. Um, because um, back then, as a jazz pianist, I was totally into Bill Evans. He was my idol, my uh, big uh, source of inspiration. And the transition from there to Ravel and the BC was uh, pretty, pretty smooth. And, um, and then into all the French music. And only later at the academy, uh, I could actually start to appreciate uh, uh, Beethoven sonata or Beethoven quintet. It took it took quite a lot of time. It took quite a lot of time. Uh, it was really it was really a transition period where, if I would sit at uh, at the library to listen to a Mahler symphony, for example. And my neighbor, uh, I would hear some jazz sound coming from his uh, uh, earphones. I would <laughs> stop the mother and go and listen to the jazz. Uh, it took some years <laughs> until it actually flipped. That that's a that's really fascinating. I mean, certainly there are plenty of people in the world who think that Mozart, Beethoven are kind of uh, simple. And obviously those years that you spent moving back through French music to through Mahler, perhaps uh, eventually Beethoven, maybe Mozart allowed you to appreciate the subtleties of those composers and the, and really the complexities of them, which that often lie beneath the surface. Um, but I'm wondering if now, whether you love that music. I, I know you well enough to, to understand that you respect the music, you appreciate the music, but do you love the music? That's a very good question. Uh, first, yes, it took, it took some years to, now I can appreciate the depth of the music and the way it breathes. Um, well, it depends. With most of the classics, um, I'm completely in love and I love playing them and uh, hearing them. Beethoven specifically is, is a, it's a bit complicated in my case. I love playing Beethoven very much. I love playing them, but I less like to listen. I found over the years that um, for example, with Mozart, it just flows. It, it simply flows. The music flows, 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 flows. And, and with Beethoven, for me, uh, I found it's a bit going tough sometimes. It's a bit like he's trying to put things in the right place. And it's, a, it's not going kind of from the spirit to the paper finito, uh, like Mozart, but it had a lot of workouts and so, and, and for me, it's a bit like um, overdone or something like that, if I can say it like that. Um, that's, but this is personal taste. This is just a personal taste. My favorite is, of course, Bach. Um, and uh, Bach is an everyday, uh, every day on the piano, every day playing. This is kind of what uh, is my co compass, I would say. Uh, something that would give me, yeah, a direction, some, uh, some uh, balance, uh, some sort of uh, anchor point. Um, Usually the preludes and fugues, the well-tempered clavier, but all the suites and of course the other big works, that's kind of an anchor. How do you find that music, Bach, 
um, ha- what of impact does that have on your own music? Is it direct or is it spiritual or is it technical, spiritual, musical, um, intellectual, all of the above, none of the above? I think it's all of the above and I can explain. Um, spiritual, yes. I mean, obviously I play it every day. I, I take it as a reference point when I need distance from my work. I go to that, it fixes me, uh-huh. and then I can go back. Uh, technically, um, well, I spent many, many years studying uh, um, the voice leading, the fugues. I mean, I'm talking about years. Uh, here in the in the Jerusalem Academy, they took it very seriously, four years of uh, counterpoint, backwards, forwards, all the way you want. And I think that though I would not think about Bach um, necessarily when I write a certain passage, but uh, it is simply there because the technique is there, the idea is there, and and counterpoint is is part of me. And this is due to really many years of uh, of analyzing, writing exercises in this style, and orchestrating a lot of the fugues, and so uh, so it was a lot of dealing with Bach, and I think this will be, it is so that that Bach is like a Parisian street. Every day, it looks different. Uh, I, you can take the same prelude and play it today, and tomorrow it will, it will be played differently, or it will, I will look at it differently. It will sound different. And of course, over the years, over the years, it will totally sound different. I would, I would, I would see other things. I would bring out other things. So it is like an endless source of, uh, of inspiration um, and of some sort of, yeah, to fix me as an artist in, in, a, in a reference point. What about the spiritual slash religious side of Bach? You're Jewish. There are many people, including me, who who believe that even though Bach's um, religious beliefs were, you know, 17th century, um, 18th century Lutheran, and in a certain way narrow, they also have a to me, they have a universality that is quite embracing, but I'm wondering how that, what impact that has on you uh, when you are looking at, studying, and thinking about Bach. Um, as you ask the question, the first image that comes to my mind, or the memory that comes to my mind, is my time as a student in Jerusalem. And and there, you know, uh, listening to suddenly Bach on the radio, or or not suddenly, they play it quite often. While, While strolling in the city or taking the car and going from place to place, and you see the churches, and you see the Mount of Olives, And you see this place and you say, wow, here, here the music makes sense. You you realize how the music is related to the place. Jesus was here. He was uh, preaching his uh, his amazing preachings. And this is universal. It has nothing to do with, I mean, the fact that we are limiting this into a religion is, in my opinion, wrong. What he was preaching for is universal, is how to be a good person. And if any religion doesn't preach it in that simple, plain way as Jesus uh, preached it, it means that it's not a true religion. It means that that it has some sort of um, another angle into it, which is not pure 
as the preachings when one reads this. So I don't think it, it Bach for me um, has nothing to do with Christian, even though of course it's all about uh, Christ, it has to do about um, something much bigger, some, some love of this world, uh, love between a person to a person. And, and that's why I feel that once one hears it, um, especially around sunset in Jerusalem, when the sun is setting on, on the old sea, mm -hmm. and you see all these things, and, and you hear a Kyrie or you hear something, you say, wow, I understand that. I understand that. It, it, is, it, is, it is very, very strong statement. Toward the beginning of COVID, so year ago, probably, um, I wrote you to ask you if you wanted to participate as one of our distinguished composers for the collage series. And, but it had been a while since we had been in touch. So I just wanted to check up on your life and what was going on in, in Israel and, and in your musical life. And along the way, I gave you a little information about me. And among the things said that after about 40 years of not composing, I was starting I was trying to write a piece, and um, I, I said that I was having great difficulty, and that after, you know, so many years of playing and conducting other people's music, including yours, of course, um, it was a huge challenge. It was sort of scary, in fact. It was frightening, because my brain didn't seem to work in that way anymore. And it was, it was at that point, I think I said, I'm having even difficulty getting, you know, to 40 measures of music. And I have a hard time deciding even what the next pitch should be. Should it be G sharp, or should it be G natural, whatever. And you in this very lovely, as you always are way, wrote back. And I'm going to quote you. You said, so happy to know that you're composing again. And you said, it takes time to get into the flow. But what I can already suggest, as you say you struggle with what notes to put down, write the gesture. Even sing it before or imagine it. Don't hold yourself because of the individu individual note. Sketch the gesture. This, one, this is one part of the brain. The critical part of the brain will find the right notes even weeks later. It will then be free to do that. Otherwise, it can lead to inner conflict and frustration. So is this advice that you, as a dear friend and wise person, gave me, but it, or is it advice you give yourself every day? Is this how you proceed? I think uh, this advice uh, took me a few years to learn. So, so yes, I think that at the beginning, uh, yeah, I could get stuck on a bar or a two bar and uh, think about this note or that note. And um, I think only when it came to um, realizing that one needs to look at the big arc that um, it really doesn't matter at that specific moment what note you start with unless it's a singer and of course it has a different or an instrument or a certain register it really doesn't matter uh, because inside the frustration comes usually uh, when Inside, you have something already to say, but it doesn't come out 
the way you already uh, unconsciously know it. So something is bubbling, something is bubbling inside. Um, then struggling with the right note, is it here, is it there? It's, it's, it's a very, it's a good recipe for frustration. So, so uh, what I do is in my work, is doing one fish of the whole thing, like um, Japanese uh, uh, drawing of the whole thing. If it's a dramatic piece, mm -hmm. it will also be uh, one 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 fish. So it could this fish could take this one big gesture could take uh, depends on the uh, material, depends on the length of the piece. If it's an opera, the first page could take a well, few months, a year. No struggling about the right notes, no struggling about writing, whatever comes. Then I leave it aside. I put it in uh, the deep freezer for, uh, for some time, clean my head by... <laughs> Clean my head by going playing Bach. <laughs> clean my head by taking a vacation. Clean my head by by going into a different piece, uh, working on a text, uh, doing other things, letting it rest, pulling it out from the deep freeze, deep frosting it, and now re-examining it, re-examining everything from the beginning. Usually, the intuitions are good. So over the years, I learned that the, the first intuitions are the right intuitions. But it could come to a certain passages or points where I would say, God, what did I want from myself here? This is completely wrong. OK, in that moment, you take the, take the pencil and you go, like that, very easy. Uh, but this is not something you can do if you struggle on each note uh, for half an hour uh, in the first in the first uh, process. You cannot do that. You cannot do this kind of uh, uh, self critique. Um, in the second phase, you can learn that okay, it's it's true. It's correct. Rhythmically, it's correct. Dramatically, it's correct, but it's still, it is still boring. So why is it boring? Ah, maybe because I need to shift the harmony a bit here. Maybe that's the wrong note. Maybe this is not clicking well with that. Now comes a, a, a regolage. You do a, a, a fine tuning uh, to the big gesture. And again, this process would take a uh, few months if it's a big work. Again to the freezer, again to rest, uh, again vacation, again to bath, taking it out again until it feels like it is, it is flowing. Um, most of the pieces um, need three stages. Um, some pieces need two. Uh, never happened to me that in once. You also wrote to me in some email over the last year that uh, your music lately has become brighter. More, you called it more consonant, um, less harsh, less dark. And of course, um, I, I can't help but think about one of your large pieces and the trains kept coming that you composed uh, for cantata singers, a piece about uh, a Holocaust-related uh, piece, very dramatic, very uh, complex, and quite dark, obviously. Um, and you said you didn't think that you would be composing music that was quite as dark as that, at least now. And I'm wondering, um, what's brought about that change and how it shows up in your music, the change towards more 
um, towards less darkness, more brightness, less, more consonants. Um, it's an interesting thing. Well, in 2014, I was going uh, some serious health issues and uh, did an operation. I was in life danger, came out of it. And one of the nurses told me, uh, you will see for people who go through this kind of operation, life changes, things don't stay the same thing. First I was like, okay, what? Then I realized, of course, there were many changes in my personal life back then. Um, but uh, something else happened. When friends told me, come back, uh, uh, come to concerts. Here, I leave you a ticket for uh, my ensemble, for this uh, piece, uh, for this concert and that concert. New music, I could not um, take the dissonances. It was something that um, was strange to me. Um, over the years, of course, I would go listen to new music concert, listen to dissonances, no problem. I enjoy. I lived it. I wrote it. After that operation, I could not uh, hold more than uh, in the intermission. I was gone. I was not there anymore. I could not take it anymore. The dissonances were actually affecting the the nerve system. And uh, from that point, I realized that um, it is not exactly my cup of tea as it used to be. And these years were years of actually going into completely different direction. I kind of did what any teenager should do and I never did, which is going into listening to rock, um, listening to uh, progressive rock, all the all the big names and so I I was really in a, a deficit of information and knowledge about this world. Um, I got into Latin music big time, into Latin music, uh, Greek music, um, and uh, a few other things. And really, um, it was a much more of a happy character, uh, let me dance while I was cutting my vegetable salad in the morning. And, <laughs> and yes, I could not do it with Trinidad, what can I say? Um, and uh, with my music, it just happened that, um, yeah, it just happened. So um, I think I went more into the dramatic direction uh, with, with certain texts. Uh, yes, there are, of course, the dissonances and the harsh moments, but they always fit um, the, the text and what the stage asked for, and I like it. So what do you hear when you listen to your older music? What's your reaction? Well, First, I don't listen, but, but here, um, three days ago, um, I left home early. Usually in the morning I compose. That morning I had to go out. I start the car, put the radio. I hear something. I was like, this is familiar. Ah, that's mine. <laughs> okay. So they play the piece. Uh, from from 94, I was still, I was a student at the academy. It's a very early piece with, with the jazz influences and so. Kind of a, a piece that fits the morning concert slot. And, uh, and I was like, wow, is it me? Is it not me? Yes, I wrote it. I remember myself sitting at the piano writing the piece. Of course, um, yeah, technique is good. No, I would not write that kind of fluffy sound uh, anymore. 
Uh, it's a, it's Lior, but it's Lior when he was 22. Um, that's how I hear the pieces. Some of your more recent music has been for audiences of children. Um, I'm wondering which has, whether the cart has led the horse or the horse has led the cart. Has the interest in writing for children also been part of this uh, move towards perhaps a more um, approachable language? Or has the change in your musical life, which came about in or your musical language came about, as you report, in, in part because of health issues that you went through and big changes in your internal life. Did that open up the door for writing to children, or has it always been an interest to you? The first piece was for children was written 2005-2006. It was... Uh, um, basically, after uh, Hans Christian Andersen, The Little Mermaid, the, the familiar story, not with the Disney end, but the real end. Um, very tonal, with a lot of, of course, um, uh, you know, different harmonic uh, changes, but tonality. I finish, finished the first sketch in three and a half weeks. And I told myself, Lior, what are you doing? This is pop music. What are you writing? I was beating myself. If I had a whip, I would beat my, whip myself. But boy, you know, it just happened. I realized at certain point that it came out of me. Then it's part of me. It is hiding somewhere. It's part of me. I let it out. Two of these pieces were written um, 2005, as I said, 2010. And the recent two uh, were because of um, my uh, personal inspiration, and that's my daughter. Um, so that the pieces are for her. And so I have four of them at the moment. How old is your daughter? She will be six in um, two weeks. And has she heard these pieces? No, not yet, because none of them was played uh, recently in Berlin. Actually, one was played when she was two and a half years old, but uh, but it's too old. Who knows? <laughs> of course, sometimes children who are un uh who maybe don't know a lot of music who certainly don't know a lot of music are quite open to kinds of musical creations that adults who have grown up on a rather more narrow diet might not be um and so i can imagine that you know when i when i say your music is perhaps more consonant now, I don't think people should read that to mean or hear that to mean that the music is uh, poppy or that it's all triads, um, uh, but rather that it's just brighter, that its, it's spirit is lighter. <laughs> Lior, tell me, tell us what you're working on now. Are you actively composing? I see music on your desk over your shoulder. Show us, show us what you're doing. This piece, uh, I never show music like this. Ah, uh, I know. All right. Uh, this piece, um, it's called Lollipop Lota. Um, it's a piece for a soprano, it's a musical theater piece 
for soprano uh, also acting uh, and a percussion player. And the story behind it goes first uh, that uh, here is the Boston, Boston Connection many, 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 many years ago. Uh, a wonderful singer, Jennifer Ash, uh, who was specializing in new music, asked for a piece for a soprano and a percussion. And uh, then came a piece called Dialogues. This piece was sitting very nicely in the drawer, drawer after the premiere. And some years after, a uh, soprano from Belgium uh, purchases the copy. And I forget about it. A few years after, I get the video of a beautiful performance of that piece from 1990. And now they ask for um, a larger piece. And um, I wrote them the text for Lollipop Lota. Lota is, um, yeah, she's uh, getting towards 30s, her 30s. She is a young sing actress. She's trying to make it. Uh, uh, she is really insecure. She depends a lot on what people say, yet she's very bossy to her roommate, <laughs> who is her, her percussionist. And basically, this journey, it's a journey of a woman that tries to find her self reflected on the looks of society or social media, and of course she gets frustrated and uh, discouraged until she goes into the process of rediscovering herself and looking inside of herself and finding uh, her uh, a peace within. Uh, so this goes over about an hour. I, it should be about an hour of music, starting very, very, uh, hectic and fluffy, you know, the, the prima donna that is running from place to place and so on. The percussion is perfect for that. And, and the piece will slow down, slow down, slow down until the last scene, which will be some sort of, um, yeah, a meditation, you could say. Uh, she sits and really focusing on herself and her inner strength and finds her peace. Uh, we did. Where are you in the process? Uh, right now, I just finished today. Uh, I wrote the short transition between Act Four and Act uh, Scene Four and Scene uh, Five. Scene Four. Uh, it's where she is very, very frustrated um, because um, she doesn't know if she's more appreciated when she's happy or she's more appreciated when she's grumpy. Um, so she is actually going to Facebook and takes a selfie with her happy and then another selfie with her grumpy. And she gets the same number of likes for both photos. So she is really frustrated what she should be, happy or grumpy, in order to be kind of accepted or liked or um, uh, uh, accepted into the society. The fifth scene, is where she is actually flirting with a guy that, that she's doing too many efforts to flirt with the guy, uh, being completely not herself, and the guy knows it. Uh, so he's not so interested. And of course, then she's very frustrated, then she goes into a diff deeper frustration and another frustration and another frustration. Uh, until she is actually facing herself. 
you said a few minutes ago that you were working on your piece for soprano and percussion this morning. Um, do you work regularly in the mornings or do you work when you, when you feel like it? No, I have a, I have a pretty regular, even strict uh, uh, schedule developed over the last uh, few years. Um, that is composing six days a week, morning um, until until early afternoon. If I orchestrate, sometimes it's with, with two sessions from so morning, then a break, then a, a second uh, session depends on the section. If I orchestrate, I always finish a section during the day. I never leave it open in the air. Um, when I compose, um, sometimes I leave in the air with dramatic pieces. I definitely bring it to, to, a, to a point. So today, for example, and I don't work by the hour, so, so I sit as much as needed. Uh, today was a relatively short session. Uh, that transition to a, is uh, is only forty seconds. It went pretty fast. Uh, after that, I took myself, went to the sea, and watched the beautiful waves. Ten minutes from there. Um, other days. Tougher section, more tougher texture, um, inspiration is not uh, flowing that day, it takes longer. It, every day is a different day. How much revising do you do when your piece is essentially done? That is, you know, it's, it's all there, there's a double bar. Um, how much, what kinds of revisions do you make? Um, nothing except small corrections that may come uh, in rehearsal due to uh, maybe a typo here or a typo there, or um, maybe uh, if uh, I ask a certain player, play this maybe, uh, a piano and not a mezzo piano that I change. It's usually only balance with uh, with uh, dynamics, rarely, but but never change. I never change the structure uh, or um, the essence. It never happened. And also, going back into a piece few years later, uh, listening to it. I would not. I would not touch it. I know that there are composers that go and, and revise works that they have uh, written ten years ago. Also, um, for me, each piece is some sort of a time signature, not in the musical same sense, but uh, mm -hmm. um, it's a an era signature. This piece is the or twenty twenty one. Uh, I'm not going to touch it in a few years, uh, or a piece that I wrote 10 years from now, it was the year 2010. Finito. Done. I don't touch it. Um, it's, it was good for that period. I'm not going to impose different ideas uh, or different aesthetics or different development uh, uh, on, on something that is already in the past. For me, at least. For the musicians and the audience, of course, it's the present, but for me, it's the past. And you're writing after this a piece for collage. Yes. We I certainly look hope. Forward to it. And we're very much looking forward to it because. Also, because the two pieces of yours that we have played were quite a long time ago, when you were living in Boston, and um, one 
existed. I, you must have written when maybe you were a student. I'm not sure. Beautiful piece. And then you wrote a piece for collage. But it's very possible they are in a very different spirit world and a different um, musical language world than whatever you end up creating for us during the this next year. Whatever it is, we really look forward to it. Talking with you is a great joy, as it always has been. And I'm very grateful to you for taking this time to spend with us. Thank you so much, David. And, and as you say this, I miss you more and more to come and, and sit and spend time with you and have uh, these beautiful chats and sit in collage concert and enjoy. This was one of the first things uh, I did in Boston. It was an eye opener for me. Back then in the <laughs> Salford University, I think, this, this amazing interview yes. hall, I, I enjoyed it so much. And I'm glad that we are in such good friendship since then. Lior Novak composed his Elegy to the Future in Tel Aviv 20 years ago in 2001 during a period of daily bombings, shootings, and growing tension. Then came the attacks on September 11th. Lior completed his short elegy at the end of that September, and the music reflects an accumulating sorrow and fear for the future. Toward the movement's close, fragments from the 23rd Piano Concerto of Mozart appear, suggesting that the pure may always be clouded in darkness. The first performance of Elegy to the Future, which was composed for collage new music, was on February 24th of that same year in the Seawalsh Theater at Suffolk University.